Hello, welcome to this first of two part series on space occupying lesions aimed at medical school finals. My name is Moise Okar, I'm an academic foundation doctor in Manchester. And I produce this video with Mitter Jengidsen, who is a consultant neurosurgeon and senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool. In the first part of the two part series, we will talk about clinical presentation and differential diagnosis of space occupying lesions. In the second part, we'll be talking about specific pathology and management. So the bottom line about clinical presentation is that it depends on the site of the pathology. Some patients can be completely asymptomatic and the lesion may just be picked up on a scan done for other reasons. The classical raise intracranial pressure headache that most textbooks describe, one that wakes the patient up from sleep, it's worse with coughing, this is actually quite rare. Now, seizures are common with temporal lobe lesions and patients may have an aura preceding the seizure which consists of funny smells or tastes as the cortical centres for these centres are located within the temporal lobes. Another common exam association is between personality change and frontal lobe tumours. Imaging helps in differential diagnosis and most patients have a non-contrast CT and MRI scan. The MRI sequences can include diffusion weighted MR which as you may know is the gold standard for detecting areas of ischemic stroke. Contrast helps to show up the vessels better and this is important if a vascular lesion or a tumour is being considered. Contrast can be given safely if the renal function allows and typically if the EGFR is more than 30 then that is considered sufficient. In specialist neuroscience centres Multimodal imaging, which consists of uh, specialist MR sequences such as MR spectroscopy or MR perfusion, can also be performed and these can help differentiate different types of brain tumours, for example, from low to high grade gliomas. A common OSCE scenario is to describe the CT or MRI head and you should use a systematic approach for this. You can use a mnemonic and one mnemonic is particularly interesting surgeons love carefully drilling massive burr holes. So the first thing you should comment on is the patient and image technique details. So on the right, this is a CT head with contrast of Mr. or Mrs. X. It is an axial sequence. The next thing to do is to comment on whether the lesion is intra or extra axial. So this means, is it within the brain parenchyma, in which case you'd say it was intraaxial, or is it outside? Now, a common pitfall is that pituitary lesions and pineal lesions are actually extraaxial. So on the right side, that is clearly an intraaxial lesion. Comment also on the shape and location of the lesion. So on the right side, this is an irregular roughly circular lesion located within the frontotemporal areas of the brain. Then you should comment on the density or intensity. Now these terms refer to how white the lesion is compared to the surrounding brain parenchyma. On the right it's clearly hyper dense. If this was an MRI scan you'd say it was hyper intense. Also comment on the border of the lesion, how well defined it is and whether there is edema around it. So on the right, it is well circumscribed and there is surrounding edema from the associated hypodense areas. In terms of contrast enhancement, this lesion is contrast enhancing. It is heterogeneously contrast enhancing and sometimes the lesion can actually just display rim enhancement, typically abscesses, so that's also something that you should comment on. There are a number of things that constitute mass effect, including effacement of the sulci. That basically means that you cannot very well see the actual sulci. Remember the depressions between the gyri, and that can be ipsilateral on the side of the lesion or contralateral. So this lesion does have some ipsilateral sulcal effacement, but not any contralateral sulcal effacement. Midline shift. Now you can actually comment on the degree of midline shift by measuring it 
but roughly speaking you can see that there is some degree of midline shift here and you should also comment on ventricular compression. This lesion is actually compressing the right frontal horn. Basal cisterns, now if the scan sequence includes the basal cisterns you can say whether the cisterns are patent or whether they are not very patent and that may suggest raised intracranial pressure. Finally, don't forget to comment on whether or not there is any hydrocephalus as a lot of mass lesions can compress the ventricular system and lead to hydrocephalus. For differential diagnosis, you may have your own surgical sieve and it should include the five main categories of brain lesions and these are vascular, infective, neoplastic, cystic and inflammatory. Typically, the ones that you will see on exams are mainly vascular and neoplastic. This slide shows various scans that you may get on your exams. The first image on the top left shows a CT head without contrast. There is an intraaxial, large, irregularly shaped lesion within the right frontotemporal lobe. It is hypodense compared to the surrounding brain and it has a well-defined border. Uh, there is a degree of midline shift and contralateral hydrocephalus. Now, this scan shows an infarct, and the giveaway here is that there is a hyperdense area, which is typical of infarcts, and it is with the distribution of the right middle cerebral artery. The next image, which is the center image on the top row, shows an MRI head. It is specifically a flare sequence. This is a special type of MRI sequence which removes a signal from around the ventricles. It shows an intraaxial circular lesion which is near the foramen of Monroe. It is hyper intense and well circumscribed. You cannot comment on contrast enhancement. It does not have mass effect. And importantly, there is actually no hydrocephalus which you can get with colloid cysts. The next image, which is the top right image, shows a MRI head. It is a T1 weighted image with contrast. It shows an extraaxial lesion arising from the left temporal convexity. It is irregular in shape. It is hyper intense with a well circumscribed border. It enhances almost homogeneously with contrast and it is compressing the left temporal surface of the brain so there is some mass effect. However, there is no hydrocephalus. This is quite typical of a meningioma. The next image is the one on the bottom left. This shows a CT head with contrast. It shows an intraaxial circular lesion within the left frontal lobe. It is hypodense mostly. There is a well circumscribed contrast enhancing border. There is some mass effect due to sulcal effacement epilaterally, and you can't comment on hydrocephalus as there are no ventricles visible. So, this is actually quite typical of an abscess. The final lesion on the right side on the bottom shows a CT head without contrast. It shows an intraaxial lesion which is deep to the right frontotemporal lobes and extends into the ventricular system. It is well circumscribed, it is hyper dense throughout. There is associated mass effect as evidenced by ipsilateral sulcal effacement and midline shift. There is associated hydrocephalus and there are hyper dense signals within the occipital vent horns of the ventricles bilaterally indicating areas of hemorrhage so this is overall most likely to be intraparenchymal hemorrhage with intraventricular extension. In summary the presentation of space occupying lesions depends on the site. A non-contrast CT followed by MRI scan is the standard first sign investigation and you should always use a systematic approach when describing these lesions and the ones that we have talked about are quite common in exams. That concludes our first tutorial and thank you very much for listening. Here are some further references.